Good evening and welcome to the talk back for the fantastic and candid film, Belly of the Beast. This talk back is sponsored by National Council of Jewish Women, Bergen County Section, Senator Loretta Weinberg, National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Inc., Bergen and Passaic Chapter, YWCA, Northern New Jersey, and The Whole Woman. My name is Tanya Lovelace, and I am the president and CEO of Lovelace Consulting Services, Inc., bringing diversity, equity, and inclusion to individuals, organizations, and systems. I previously was the founding CEO for Women of Color Network, Inc., where I spent close to two decades working to end violence against all women by centralizing the voices, the wellness, and the leadership of women of color. As a survivor of child abuse, bullying, teen dating violence, and domestic violence. I am a global intersectional leader, and I have been a dedicated organizer, movement maker, and gender violence advocate for over 35 years. And I'm terribly pleased to be tonight's moderator. And now I'm thrilled to introduce our panelists. Erica Cohn, who is the director of this film. Erica Cohn is a Peabody, an Emmy award-winning filmmaker recognized by Variety as one of 2017's top documentary filmmakers. Most recently, Erica directed, produced, and produced The Judge, which was filmed at, or which was aired at TIFF 2017 and co-directed and produced In Football We Trust, which also was aired at Sundance 2015. Belly of the Beast, a New York Times critics pick, is her third feature documentary. And next I'll move to Helen Arkentau, CEO, YWCA of Northern New Jersey. And as executive director or chief executive officer of YWCA Northern New Jersey, since 2011, Helen is focusing on, is focused on guiding the agency into its next century of living its mission to eliminate racism, empower women and strengthen communities. Helen has overseen the development of a continuum of programs to support women and families in every stage of life, as well as to raise awareness and take action to end, racial, to end racial and social just injustice. In 2019, under Helen's leadership, the organization expanded its service area to Essex, Hudson, Morris, and Passaic, in addition to Bergen County. I'd like to then move on to introducing Dr. Tanya Raggio Pagan Ashley. She has dedicated her life to improving and eliminating health disparities and creating health equity in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner. Tanya has collaborated with others to improve healthcare access and provide quality, affordable health services. She is board certified in preventative medicine, pediatrics, completed a cardiovascular epidemiology fellowship and is a licensed clergy. Dr. Uragio resides in Teaneck, New Jersey, and her husband, the Dr. Willard W.C. Ashley, and their therapy dog, Serafina. I'd also like to introduce Senator Loretta Weinberg. Loretta Weinberg was elected to the New Jersey State Senate, District 37, in November 2005. She is currently the Senate Majority Leader and also serves on the Senate Judiciary Committee. She is vice chair of the Legislative Oversight Committee and the co-chair of the Senate Legislative Committee. She also sits on the New Jersey Israel Commission, the New Jersey Historical Commission and State Legislative Services Commission. Senator Weinberg is the first to run as a Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor in the state of New Jersey. Prior to joining the state Senate, she served in the New Jersey General Assembly for 14 years. In 2011, director Yuav Patash released his Hillman Prize winning documentary, Crime After Crime, 
This film tells the story of Debbie Piegler, legal of Debbie Piegler's legal battle to secure her release and freedom. Senator Weinberg was invited to a screening of this film in 2012. By then, 16-year-old and New Jersey native Michaela Manga. Seeing the harrowing story of Piegler led Senator Weinberg to introduce her own Debbie's Law. Senator Weinberg also recommended that the film be screened at this year's Teaneck International Film Festival, where it won Audiences Award for Best Feature. The, the legislation would help women imprisoned for committing crimes against their abusers by creating a program that identifies these individuals as well as give them a path towards re reintegration. Through the New Jersey Department of Corrections, inmates identified by the State Parole Board would go through a period of training, reintegration plan, and finally community supervision. The bill passed the Senate 39 to zero on August 27, 2020. It was released to the Assembly Women and Children Committee, but has not reached the floor for a vote. Recently, Senator Weinberg has called into question the mental, physical, and sexual abuse women face while incarcerated at Edna Mahan Women's Correctional Facility, the only state-operated women's prison. In July, former inmates appeared before the work, the work group on harassment, sexual assault, and misogyny in New Jersey's politics. And I just wanna thank every single one of you so much for being on this panel. I, as a new moderator, have to admit, a little bit nervous, really excited to be here, really excited for this opportunity and looking forward to speaking to each and every one of you. And before we get really started with the panel, I'd like to remind the audience that this talk back is in real time. And you may ask questions via chat. There are already so many things coming through and really look forward to digging into some of those as we get, um, as we move forward with the panel. Uh, but first, I would like to get started with, uh, with our panel and to start with Erica. Uh, Erica is our esteemed director and so delighted to have Erica with us in person and being able to share um, her perspective. Uh, Erica, um, first, this was a truly moving film and poignant, um, and, and poignant um, production. And uh, really for all of us, we've been remarking about how much of an impact it has made. Please share with us your personal motivations for making this film. Sure, I just wanna first off, first start out by saying thank you for showing the film. Um, although I can't see all of you who are watching this, uh, this Q&A right now, I'm very excited to hear your thoughts and your responses. And also just what an incredible panel to be on. I mean, all the, just a powerhouse group of women. So I'm really in awe of all of, of, all of your accomplishments and, and very privileged to be a part of this tonight. I was first introduced to attorney Cynthia Chandler in 2010 through a mutual friend. And I was really inspired by Cynthia's compassionate release work. She was the first attorney in California to get someone out of prison under compassionate release and was very inspired by Justice Now, the organization that she co-founded, which was one of the only organizations, if not the only organization in the country that had board members who are currently incarcerated really informing strategy and informing policy from the inside out instead of so oftentimes working from the outside in. And Justice Now had a campaign called the Let Our Families Have a Future campaign, which essentially exposed the multiple ways that prisons destroy the basic fundamental human right to family. One of the most heinous, of course, being the illegal sterilizations primarily targeting women of color. And to me, that screamed eugenics immediately. As a Jewish woman who grew up in Salt Lake City, the phrase never again was always profoundly in the back of my mind. And when I learned about this different kind of genocide that was happening through imprisonment, that was happening through forced sterilizations behind bars, I knew that I wanted to get involved. And initially that was as a volunteer. 
Cynthia invited me into the organization where I later became a volunteer legal advocate providing direct service needs for over 150 people inside California's women's prisons. And from there began collaborating with people inside on a project that ultimately would become Belly of the Beast. And in the initial first days of the inception of this project, I thought that this would really be chronicling the incredible human rights documentation work that was happening inside prison that was really funneled out through this underground community of activists because the prisons didn't want you know, the outside free world knowing what was going on and how through these allied organizations that work was amplified. And that all changed when I met Kelly Dillon. I had heard about Kelly and her powerful activism from so many people inside, but didn't actually have a chance to meet her until a couple of years into the process. She was working as a community interventionist in Los Angeles at the time doing gang intervention and domestic violence prevention work. And at that point was not interested in really telling her story. She was very career focused, didn't wanna kind of dive back into the trauma of what happened, but decided to become involved behind the scenes as an advisor. And so we began collaborating with this very unique relationship. And that again changed when the Center for Investigative Reporting released their very controversial findings about the tubal ligations that were happening during labor and delivery. And that was the moment that Kelly really got called back in. The movement needed her to testify on behalf of so many people who wouldn't be able to testify. And that was the moment that we both decided that we would start filming her experiences leading up to, the tra to, the, to her testifying. And the more we filmed, the more it became clear that the film really needed to center around her story and her relationship with attorney Cynthia Chandler. Had it not been for Kelly in the first place, her courage for exposing not only what happened to her, but others, there wouldn't be a film. There wouldn't have been Center for Investigative Reporting. There, we wouldn't be where we are today. So it really pays tribute to, to Kelly's story and, and her courage and impetus. Yeah, it was amazing to watch the film pivot in that way to become very clear at some point um, that the film was going to really feature her story. Um, and it was, it was amazing to have it re reiterated throughout the film that without her and her bravery, right? Without her trailblazing and her, and her truth that you may not have gotten to where you've gotten. Um, and I hear you, you're saying that from your own perspective um, and from, from your experience, um, that never again was your motivation, um, but it also just really seems so clear that the motivation truly are uh, the women themselves, the, the women that are on the board who are in, currently incarcerated, um, Kelly telling her story. So um, are there any, uh, is there any other um, sort of uh, gut perspective that you wanna share with folks about what this has meant to you to actually make this film? I mean, this film was made in collaboration with survivors. So this film was always made with and for people who are in prison. And the unique collaboration that Cynthia and Kelly and other survivors had in telling this story was so instrumental. Also as a legal advocate, I was deeply embedded in the prison abolition movement, in the movement for advocating for justice for these survivors and um, with you know other heinous, heinous human rights abuses that were happening. And I think it's, it's really important to to place in context that imprisonment itself is a form of genocide. Hmm. When you look at who is locked up, you know, women being the fastest growing prison population, specifically women of color being the most impacted. When you look at increasing long, increasingly long sentences, you know, prison destroys the fundamental human right to family. If you are locked up throughout your reproductive capacity years, you are therefore unable to reproduce. If you are torn away from your family for exceedingly long sentences, the human right to family is destroyed. Thank you, thank you so much. And what I'd like to now do is open it up to our wonderful panelists. Again, we have Senator Loretta Weinberg, we have Dr. Tanya Pagan Raggio Ashley, we have we have Helen Arshantu on the uh, call as well. And I would love to hear. Um, you all really just speak to what was your um, 
what is your initial reaction to this film? Um, why don't we start with Helen? Well, you know, it was anger. <laughs> I mean, it was just very clearly anger. It's um, unbelievable that this is still happening in our country. Um, you know, we know that we have a history of medical racism in this country. Um, and we know that this is, we have even recent reports of this happening in our, in our um, ICE detention centers. So I, I think the fact that this is still happening is um, just provoked a lot of anger for me as, as I was watching it. Um, you know, also just the, the thought that, uh, you know, that women because they're poor or because they're mentally ill or because their backgrounds are regarded as undesirable. Um, and that's the justification that this country has created for doing, <laughs> you know, for doing this. And that, is unacceptable. I mean, as women, we need to stand together. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, all of the organizations that came together and individuals like Senator Weinberg to support this film and sponsor this film, that's what we all have in common. Um, we are we are individuals, we are organizations that support women, all women. <laughs> um, and, and I think that uh, that was the impetus, you know, not to speak for all of us as sponsors, but for myself and, and I know the other, entities because we all work very closely together. Um, but, you know, we stand together for women and to watch this and know that people didn't stand together for women um, and other women didn't stand together for women is unconscionable. And, um, you know, it, it so deeply looks at so many issues related to women. Uh, it looks at the struggles of motherhood. It looks at the struggles of reproductive rights. It looks at uh, classism. It looks at activism, it looks at domestic violence. Again, all issues that all of the organizations, everyone who's sponsoring this, the individuals, we're all very dedicated to, um, to addressing and supporting. So it really was just, you know, anger and um, it, it just uh, spurred the importance of standing together as women. Thank you, thank you so much, Helen. And your la I know your last name is Arkantu, and I uh, <laughs> continue to see the CH and want to do something different with it, but I'm clear, and uh, thank you for your patience with me. Um, and I'd love to hear from Dr. Uh, Tanya Bagan Raggio. If can, we can share a little bit as well from your perspective on just um, what is your first, re what is your initial first reaction to the film? Well, first of all, thank you, Ms. Lovelace, and I certainly thank all who were involved with this film, especially the women who were incarcerated as an Afro-Borinqua, and Borinqua, it means I'm an Afro-Puerto Rican. It was both shocking, but absolutely not surprising. I thought how brave the women were, like Kelly Dillon, to speak up. One should never, never get used to women or ladies being treated in this manner. It is an extension a continuation of what has been done to black women since slavery, to Latinx women, to low income women, to special needs women and women of the Jewish faith, as was said earlier in Nazi Germany. And she is right, never again, nunca mas, no more. Sterilization used to be so common for black women. There was a derogatory term for it. It was called the Mississippi appendectomy due to sterilizing untold hundreds of thousands of generations of black women. Or in Puerto Rico, La Operacion, where a third of Puerto Rican women were sterilized between 1930 and 1970. The late Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias said sterilization was a way of population control, but women should have the right to birth control, an individual right to choose the kind of birth control they should have not for sterilization. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, and I would like to ask, you know, as a doctor, right? Just what has the specific impact had uh, for you from that perspective? Well, as, as a doctor, um, when I love women, right? Cause I'm a woman, I'm a doctor, but I'm a woman first and I'm a woman of, of color who's, who's a doctor. And as a doctor, we take an oath 
Prima nona sera, first thing, no harm. The nurse spoke about this, right? Yes. And when you are a woman and you're in pain, as these women were, okay, they were complaining of pelvic pain, they have an expectation, they have a right to be treated as human beings, to be listened to, to be heard, for their symptoms to be diagnosed properly, to be evaluated properly, and for someone to sit down and explain to them, this is what's wrong, this, these are the different things that can be done to help you. This, these are the things that could happen if we do it this way. These are the things that can happen if we do it that way. So that the woman has a full understanding. And that type of an explanation wasn't even provided. Basic education and communication because they weren't respected as human beings. And therefore what happened is they weren't given appropriate options to choose what could happen. And they were out and out lied to in terms of the procedures that were done. And for the problems that these women were speaking of, okay, most of them could be treated, for example, if they had a sexually transmitted infection causing the pain, Antibiotics treat that. If a woman really, you know, she had an ovarian cyst or something going on with her ovaries, many times we treat that with hormones or, you know, sometimes I'm not an OB, you know, sometimes the, our, my OB colleagues will do a laparoscopy, you know, they'll look and they'll see what's going on. If they have endometriosis, that is treatable. Even if you have fibroids, you can you can have something called a myomectomy where you take the fibroid off and you preserve the uterus. And just because a woman has children, you don't have the right to say to a woman, regardless of her income status, regardless of her color, whether or not she can have more children. That's what I think as a doctor. Thank you. Thank you for your multi-layered um, perspective as a Black Boricua and then also in being able to really lay out uh, the medical perspective. And that's, uh, that's truly important. Thank you. Um, Senator Weinstein, oh, excuse me, Weinberg, I would love uh, to get your perspective. There's a lot of policy insight here and other perspectives that I'm sure that you'd be willing and able to share. And so uh, if you would like to unmute yourself, I would love to hear uh, you share your perspective. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, let me make a statement. Forced sterilization is against the law in the state of New Jersey. So uh, th that is clear. However, what I found in watching this film is the commonality of women inmates, the fact that such large percentages, whether you were talking about this film made in a California prison system, as opposed to the Edna Mayan uh, Women's Correctional Facility here in New Jersey, is uh, that the, such a large percentage of these inmates are there because they are victims of domestic violence or abuse. So seeing that commonality and the inhumane treatment of women, the lack of privacy, male, the issues around having uh, male guards in guarding uh, female inmates, all of this taking away of any dignity that's left and, and let me point out the bravery. One of, one of the earlier speakers here, I think, talked about that. But you know, when you are an inmate, if you speak up, there are many, many ways that retribution can be meted out to you. So women who choose to speak up or speak out are very brave and very courageous. 
And this is an issue that we are trying to deal with now in our own women's prison correctional institute, institution right here in New Jersey. So to the filmmaker, thank you for bring, making this story so real, but as you said to Kelly Dillon, who agreed to put herself forth in this way, it is, it, it will make changes, it might take a little while, but it will result in changes and it's a combination of the uh, film. I'd like to ask the filmmaker because I couldn't quite understand. Do you have a legal background, a, a filmmaking background? How, to, how did you come to this by way of your own background? As both a filmmaker and as a volunteer legal advocate. Uh, and, but you're not an attorney? Not an attorney, a legal oh. advocate. Um, so uh, did direct service work with people in California's women's prisons. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for doing it. And thank you again to the Teaneck Film Festival for always um, pricking our consciences here. Thank you, Senator Weinberg. Absolutely. Tapping into film and uh, the most poignant film at the time, right? And, and ensuring that that is laid here. And and, and thank you, um, Senator Weinberg, making sure that uh, you're recommending film in, as well and, and, and really ensuring that uh, you're putting uh, truth to actual action um, and, and making sure that some of this shows up in terms of passing bills and laws. And so there is one thing that comes from the, that comes from the, the chat that I wanna um, just give you an opportunity to respond to and then I'm going to come back to the panel is, you know, someone is saying here that once a bill is passed, often nothing changes. How can we make monitoring more effective so that we can be sure women are treated without abuse? And then they state that, for example, recently the New Jersey legislature passed some bills, including to stop women being put into shackles for labor and delivery and train guards at, um, at EMCF uh, to begin change um, regarding the uh, sexually assaultive culture there. And, and, and what they wanna know is, is how do we know this is happening and what can we do to make sure that women are treated without abuse? Well, women are abused in the uh, prison system. There's no doubt there, uh, we've been dealing with this, as I said, at the Edna Mann um, Correctional Institution for a couple of years now, there have been um, public uh, reports, uh, people coming forth. I have a, an informal women's work group on misogyny and a lot of other issues. And we heard from a whole group of former inmates uh, at Edna Mayan. We had some inmates who were willing to come forth but I really didn't want it within the, this group because there was no way that I could guarantee their safety. Mm. So we opted only to hear from the former inmates. So yes, there's a lot that needs to be done. And what needs to be done is we need public involvement, public input, the kind of thing we're doing here tonight and reaching out to your own representatives, whether state or federal, and uh, keeping a spotlight uh, on this. We're really just beginning with the help of the Attorney General, Grabeer Grewal, here in New Jersey, to try to get a handle on the years of abuse right at Edna Mayan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate that. And um, there are more questions that we will come back to um, across the, the board here, uh, several that are coming in around policy and several that are coming in specifically about women's prison and so forth. And we'll come back to those. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is to check back in with Helen. Um, you know, Helen, you really started to get into kind of the multi-prong. You started you and then Tanya 
uh, picked up more and then, uh, and you know, certainly Erica laid them out and, 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 um, and definitely appreciate Loretta's policy um, lens on this. But uh, there, you know, when reflecting on multi-pronged issues of eugenics, of sterilization, reproductive justice, human rights for incarcerated women, domestic violence, and racial justice, what does this bring up for you from the vantage point of your own individual area of expertise and, and, and how it connects other areas, right? And so what can you share with us? Well, at the YWCA of Northern New Jersey, our primary focus is not reproductive rights, but we are a women's organization. And so we have a history and an obligation to empowering women and supporting them in all areas. So obviously this, you know, falls into that and is one of them. You know, we believe strongly that no woman should have their personal rights taken away and, you know, without their knowledge um, um, or coerced in any way. Uh, our organization nationally has a over 160 year history of educating and empowering women. So um, we believe strongly that choosing to have children or not have children is an individual right. <laughs> and um, not for the government, not for the judicial system, you know, to make for us. Uh, you know, we talk about wanting equality for women. Well, making sure that women have the ability to make these decisions is paramount for us to ever really be able to stake that claim of equality for sure. And Helen, one of the things that came up for me during the film as somebody who's been doing domestic violence advocacy for, for decades now, um, and, and I know you're steeped in this work, you know, the, the, I think the part of the story that was described, but of course there wasn't sort of the same policy approach because I mean, they could have gone in several directions. Erica could have gone in several directions with the film, but the part about, um, Kelly's reason for being in jail in the first place, right? Um, and, and really certainly having protected um, herself and her family, I felt was, a, was, really, was really critical and, and that there are just so many women in jail related to that. And could you speak a little bit um, to that from sort of the vantage point of your work and, and your perspective? Well, you know, again, I, I think, you know, one of the things that has really been a theme of this time is looking at systemic racism, correct? Um, and, and looking at all of our systems and how they're fraught with racism. Obviously, since George Floyd was murdered, we've had a real spotlight on um, our uh, law enforcement, but our, our prison system obviously is one of the areas that is definitely fraught with this issue. And our judicial system, when they're um, you know, working and looking at these cases of women coming in that are impacted by domestic violence. Again, our organization at the YW Save Northern New Jersey focuses on sexual violence, but obviously because sexual violence and domestic violence are so closely linked, we work very closely with Center for Hope and Safety and Alternatives for Domestic Violence and all the other organizations right within Burton County. And, and so our, our clients very often are connected. Um, but it, it, it speaks to what it really speaks to as our systems and that the there are so many layers of these systems that are involved in promoting and supporting um, you know what's happening and, and, and uh, with two women and putting them you know in the situation that they're ending up incarcerated when that is not at all where they deserve to be so um, you know as a society and as a state and you know grateful for you know, the leadership that we have and, and our watchdogs that we have here in New Jersey that are that are looking at these issues, but more work has to be done clearly um, to really spotlight and dissect how we can uh, break down the systemic racism that we're seeing because, um, you know, women and, you know, women of color, black women don't have a chance, um, you know, in these situations because the systems are just working against them. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for laying that out even further. And uh, Tanya, um, uh, Dr. Pagan, Raggio, Ashley, I'd love to, for you to sort of go deeper in as well into, and you, and you definitely laid it out in such a beautiful way, but the sort of the intersections and the overlapping issues um, of identities that are expressed here in this film, as well as experiences. And just wondering, um, what is your, um, uh, from your vantage point and from your area of expertise, and just from your perspective as well, 
uh, are there, is there more that you would like to share about what you saw in the film and what stood out for you? Yes, um, and I, I'm trying to, <laughs> to, to process that. Um, so in following up regarding the issues of sterilization and reproductive justice, women have a fundamental right to be respected. We have to start with the R word, okay? And the R word is not only racism, it's also respected. Women get subjected to domestic violence, to intimate partner violence, because predators see that they're vulnerable because many of the women have experienced adverse childhood experiences. Most of the women have been traumatized. So people see that and then they take advantage of it. And no one has the right to physically harm a woman or to emotionally harm a woman. And then they come into prison, they come into prison. And then when they're coming for health care, they're not even receiving the standards of care, okay? The American, I, I know in the film, there was some disagreement between the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and, and you know, in the case, but, but <laughs> I would like to say this for all of my colleagues who are on the phone and who are not on the phone, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has standards of care, okay? And, and Senator Weinberg was talking about the law earlier. The law is, that we are supposed to provide standard of care, evidence-based care, but it's not being carried out, just as she said. You know, there, there is the law and then there is implementing the law. In addition to that, there are civil rights laws. We haven't even gotten into that yet. And, and looking at this film, okay, and looking at this film, no one has really touched, I mean, they did an excellent job, but we really didn't speak about the fact that many of the women who were incarcerated may have, may not have the level of education to even understand the consent that they're being asked to sign, let alone the manner in which they were asked to sign the consent. Part of signing a consent is that you're supposed to start with you examine a patient, you talk with a patient, a person, I, when I say a patient, um, and then you get to the consent part, okay? Now, if the consent is not written in the right way, most consents are at a very high level, educational level. It's not explained. If it's not written in the correct language, and by the way, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act says that if someone is English limited proficient, that, that, that whatever information you give them, whatever care, it needs to be done language appropriate. We haven't even talked about those issues. So the women's rights were being violated in so many ways that we're not following the standard of care or the law. And, and we really need to deal with that because we have, we pretty much have a lot of law. It's a matter of it being implemented and a lot of the laws being updated and changed. And so, for example, in New Jersey, we have the Dignity Act, okay? And then recently we had, um, we, we, um, we, we, we developed a commission on women and reentry to make sure that we carry out the needs that the women have in prison in terms of their health care, in terms of basic hygiene, in terms of all the social determinants of health. But the thing is making sure those things happen. Amazing. Thank you for laying that out. And, and definitely the, the Dignity Act is impacting several um, pieces of legislation. And as a person who's working on the Violence Against Women Act, I've been a part of the, the past two uh, reauthorizations and a part of the this, this upcoming one as well, we're definitely trying to make linkages and connections to the Dignity Act um, and trying to enforce and ensure then that there's crosstalk between the pieces of legislation so that there is this, this wraparound care for um, incarcerated women. Um, and, and so, you know, but you raise 
two points that I think are so critical. One of them is simply that this is a matter of civil rights, but really even bigger than that is a matter of human rights, right? So we're talking basic human rights. And, and at the same time, we're also talking about consent, right? And so I would love to hear Erica speak a little bit more about, you know, from this, from the film, I mean, I think that, you know, a thing that kept resonating for me was just consent, right? Consent was just, um, was just so trampled on throughout this entire film. And uh, what is your thought that you would like to sort of add around this context of human rights and, con and, and um, as well as consent in this, in this, uh, within this, the context of your film? Yeah, thank you, thank you for that, and and thank you, Dr. Pagan Raggio Ashley, for um for kind of the context that you just brought in I, I, about consent, um and I'd like to come back to that in one in one minute. In addition to the standards of care, in addition to the legal kind of backdrop, what's really missing from the conversation, in my perspective, is accountability. I believe that when we hold our institutions and state actors who have committed these harms accountable, we can prevent abuses from happening. And so specifically in California, in 2003, the governor apologized for California's heinous eugenics history between 1909 and 1979, having sterilized over 20,000 people, one third of the entire nation's sterilizations. And yet this was still going on in women's prisons. It was illegal according to state law, federal law, international law. So why does it continue to happen? Because there's no accountability. We can talk about this, we can have an official apology, which is very meaningful, but to atone for our sins, to atone for our history, we have to have accountability. And one of the things that people can do right now is to sign a petition for California's four sterilization survivors on our website, bellythebeastfilm.com. And I believe that will not only continue to make amends for the historical sterilizations following in the footsteps of two states, North Carolina and Virginia, who have passed reparations movements, but also to ensure accountability for modern day instances of forced sterilization, like what happened a few years in California's women's prisons and like what we have just seen in the ICE detention center in Georgia. Circling back to the consent kind of question, I mean, this is, the I'll tell you totally uh, behind the scenes in the filmmaking process, the first title, however horrible it was, was called Inside Consent because mm. The, because that is what this film is ultimately yeah. about, yeah. the notion of consent. And actually, if you, if you examine the way that the film has been visually represented, it all comes back to consent. You know, we really wanted to reimagine how we visualize imprisonment and wanted to place viewers in these intimate, uncomfortable, vulnerable places like the exam room table. You see the legs dangling from the, from the exam room table, like being handcuffed to a gurney being wheeled into a surgical room. Those are the, those are the images that really beg the notion, is, is consent even possible within these coercive environments? And so I wanted to, I really wanted the audience to, to be placed in these very uncomfortable moments. Thank you. Thank you very much for laying that out. And it was so well done. And it just, um, you, you went for it. And, 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 it, and I think it got every single one of us. And, you know, Senator um, Weinberg, I know that, that uh, you know, for you, you've been able, again, to actualize um, a lot of these perspectives they were talking about in through policy, right? And in August 2020, being able to actually have something pass, which is, is amazing. Um, you know, can you speak a little bit more about what it means to try from a policy perspective to take these multi-layered experiences um, of consent, of identity, of human rights, um, and, uh, and, and really try to make them um, useful from a perspective of law and, and to then bring additional laws to reinforce what's already in law, right? <laughs> like that, that already says it is not right, right? So how do you, how do you balance all of this? <laughs> I say by not, not keeping my eyes on the big picture. Hmm. Because if I did, I would have given up a long time ago. 
God bless but you. just looking at the steps that I can have some influence over and reaching out to the many terrific people, women, people like Helen and the YWCA, like Dr. Pagan, who can help build the coalitions, people like the sponsors of this film, National Council of Jewish Women, 100 Black Women. I'm a life member of National Council of Jewish Women, and I always toast them because I always tell them when I need somebody that looks respectable to come before a committee to testify, I call on them. They're usually older women, women in my age bracket. And as I say, give a respectable uh, look to what we're trying to do. But, you know, the whole issue of incarcerated women we had issues around whether women were given enough sanitary pads during their periods. That we had to have a discussion with the prison system that you don't limit a product like that to a female inmate. But I, I, I'd like to pose something to the doctor because when these kind of hysterectomies are performed particularly on young women, on younger women, what about, what does it do to their bodies? The hormonal balance, the issues that if somebody was getting a hysterectomy because they needed to, would they be giving, get, they'd be given hormones uh, to follow up, that kind of thing. So I think there are so many ancillary things to what this kind of surgery does particularly, as I said, to younger women. I, I don't know if the doctor can speak to that, but I would like if she could. <laughs> Should I go ahead? Oh, yes, I was gonna say, oh, yes, please. And oh, first, okay. <laughs> first of all, thank you, thank you, Senator, for, um, for definitely uh, bringing, bringing a, 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 just a really poignant question. And, and for others that are on the panel, if there are questions you also wanna offer, and there is a great list of um, questions here in the, um, in the chat that I will also be posing, and, and that's gonna be our next, our, our, our next phase, is sort of cross-questioning and conversation and questions from the chat. But yes, please do. So uh, first of all, before I even answer, I, I just have to really thank Senator Weinberg. I mean, and this is gonna sound really hokey and I don't mean it to be, but you know, I went to Teaneck High School and so I grew up really, no, admiring Senator Weinberg and what we're able to do today, we're able to do because we have a Senator Weinberg you know, we have our governors, you know, Governor Murphy, Governor McGreevy, you know, so many people in the assembly in the Senate, but we have Senator Weinberg who's been steady, steady on this issue. And I hope it's okay. I just want to say thank you. Um, having said that, Senator, you know, I'm not an OBGYN. I'm gonna do my best to answer your question, but you know, it's a very interesting question that you ask because one can do a hysterectomy, right? and leave the ovaries there. What these women are describing though, and, and it goes to your, your question, is they are taking out their uteri, they, you know, each one has a uterus, they're taking out their ovaries or they're doing surgery where it sounds like they are clipping. And if any of my OB colleagues are on the phone, help a sister out, but they're, they're, they're cutting, the, cutting the arteries that, that feed the, the, the ovaries. And so basically you have placed these women into premature menopause, okay? And, and you are correct. You know, when, when you do that, I mean, it is, Beyond cruel, it is malpractice, really, not to be um, evaluating them and treating them. They, they, they usually do need, you know, supplemental hormones. Um, and uh, I mean, it's just cruel what was done, but, but you're absolutely correct. These are young women who you have, for, for no good reason, put it, you know, taken out their uteruses, put them into premature menopause, and then not treated them, not treat them appropriately after you've done that with appropriate hormonal therapy. Um, 
Having said that, you know, Senator Weinberg, one of the things is, you know, that we've, we've talked about in other meetings is that no woman, no woman should be allowed to have a hysterectomy or be sterilized, you know, unless she specifically asks and says, you know, I'd like to have a tubal ligation. Not a lot of very young women are going to ask that, okay? And I, I think that one of the things we need to do across the nation is to have a moratorium. I mean, just a straight out moratorium that you cannot do hysterectomies and sterilization as well as take out women's ovaries or just destroy their ovaries, you know, without getting a second opinion. You think this woman needs a hysterectomy? You think she needs to be sterilized? You get a second opinion, from an OBGYN outside of the prison system, like our wonderful Rutgers colleagues, I, I, if I, you know, and and colleagues from Meridian, whatever health system they're in, we have unbelievably wonderful OBGYNs out there. Okay, nurse practitioners, PAs who are working with them, who can do an evaluation, give a second opinion, and then. Also, there are the standards of care. Let's say you do have to do that. There are standards of care to follow. So, so Senator, I hope I ask, answered your question. Um, I thank you for asking that. And if my OBs on the phone want to chip in, you go right on ahead. <laughs> well, there hasn't been a question around that, but there is a question here that says, are there ways of structuring medical care for prisoners to be completely independent of the total power that, prison, that prisons have over prisoners, like having their own EB, OBGYN you know, clinic like they had at, the, at that one prison. And so that prisoners can be given true, free, you know, truly free informed consent uh, within that context. So in other words, is there a way to sort of privatize uh, the, the, the medical you know, experience that women are having um, in a much more um, private way so that they are not, uh, so that it's not the state that is making these decisions and that they're having to get, uh, that, that that's attempting to get consent from them. And so I think the question is, is, is there a way or do you think that that is a good point of consideration? And I think for anybody else on the panel, is that a point of consideration? Uh, I think that would be very difficult to do, uh, to actually, in practice, to give women the right to name their own physician and then have the physician come into the correctional institutional setting. Or have to, them go out is what the, I think the question also is. Yeah, well, I, it's something that is worthy of thinking about. But uh, when I start thinking about it, I don't think of their roadblocks. Uh, what I would like to do, and I wrote down the name of the group in California, the Justice Now group, is reach out to them and see what expertise they can give us here in New Jersey from what they've learned. So uh, that, that's one of my follow-ups from here. I definitely think that's a great perspective because the idea that consent can happen within a state run state environment uh, is, is no different than, for example, the slavery institution and the assumption that mm -hmm. folks who are enslaved can actually make decisions um, or not so much not not that they can't make decisions, but that they actually can um, that there can actually be consent uh, within within that context. Uh, it just that is that is not a true concept. Right. And so um, I love you being able to speak to Justice Now because I just think that they are thinking beyond uh, what folks are generally thinking and by virtue of having um, incarcerated women on their board who then will run Justice Now with that being mm -hmm. the vision is just, um, is just unbelievable. And so Erica, I see that you've unmuted yourself. I'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah, Senator Weinberg, I'd love to put you in touch with um, a couple organizations. Justice Now is, is actually no longer doing this work. Um, they've gone through a variety of, of transitions. This work nearly killed the organization, as you can imagine. Um, but California Coalition for Women Prisoners um, is a, a key partner in the reparations movement. They've sponsored the bill with California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. 
on the Disability Rights and Education Defense Fund. And they are uh, an, an incredible organization that is providing direct service uh, needs to, to people in California's women's prisons and a great allied organization. So would love to connect you with them. And it would be great if you could type that in the chat for this space as well. Uh, so Absolutely. that folks, uh, could you repeat that one, the California Coalition, could you mention that group again? Uh, it's CCWP, California Coalition for Women Prisoners. And they are in coalition with uh, California Latinas for Reproductive Justice and the Disability Rights and Education Defense Fund on the reparations movement. Well, and it's interesting that you, well, I was just gonna say, it's interesting that you say that because the question here is have reparations been awarded um, in any place in, any, in the country um, for, for cases like this? So North Carolina and Virginia were the first two states to pass reparations for sterilization survivors in the historic eugenics program. There have not been reparations for those who were sterilized um, in you know, present day or recently. Um, California would really be the first. And I just also want to want to circle back to the to the question about is informed consent like what can we do um, about consent in prison? And I think it's important to note that these sterilization procedures actually did not happen in the prisons. That people who were in prison were sent to outside contracted hospitals, and specific to California, some of these sterilization procedures occurred in teaching hospitals. And so that would be UC Davis, UC San Diego. And so when we look at the layers of layers upon layers of approvals that needed to happen for one person's procedure to be approved, including the federal government, the California's federal receivers you learned in the film was, was brought in to oversee healthcare in, in California's women's prisons, that this is you know the prison doctor, this is an outside contracted doctor. This is the state. This is the chief medical officer. This is the federal government. So in terms of, of actual consent, yes, it's in, imperative that we have second opinions, um, access to second opinions to outside contracted doctors. However, that is also what has already been happening. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to shout out some of the comments that are here in the chat and they're general comments, but I think that it's important to state. So one of them is, wow, is this nurse serious? <laughs> Talking about the, the piece towards the end and the retaliation um, and, that, and, that, and that really stood out. Um, someone stated that um, even with legislation, in, enforcement is near impossible um, and prisoners have very few rights that the legal system respects and protects. Um, others stated that not all incarcerated people have made bad choices nor committed crimes. For some, their only crime has been being poor, being a person of color, being immigrant, being LGBT, and et cetera. Um, someone mentioned that it's just really a shocking film. And I, and I love that we've been able to talk about New Jersey because they were asking about New Jersey. There's someone here who's talking about um, about you know, how can we make prisons accountable? And I love that that was something you zeroed in on earlier, Erica. And I just think that what stood out to me, of course, was that there was no accountability um, and that there were no consequences for any of the folks, for the guy who's you know, eating food while he's giving, doing gynecology procedures. Um, really, there's nothing happening other than settlements. Um, and, and I really um, want to um, to zero in on a piece that was that was that I think we haven't touched upon as much, but I would like to hear. And this is regarding trauma. Um, you know, someone really asked the question, um, and I thought I had it right here, uh, but it was it was a it, it is a question um, that really laid out the fact that okay. Um, that there needs to be awareness about the trauma of incarceration. Um, most people have no idea of the obstacles and challenges faced while incarcerated um, and after coming home, especially for women. And so I was wondering if anyone would wanna really speak to the perspective of trauma, uh, the trauma of violence, uh, the trauma of, um, of uh, reproductive um, wrongs, uh, the, you know, just really the sexism and the racism and the classism um, and the various pieces that we saw here. 
and and really ageism and other factors that we were that we were really seeing on this film. Is there are there any perspectives around trauma that anyone anyone will want to share? Yes, Doctor, I see that you've um, unmuted yourself. Um, I think earlier I, I I started to speak to this issue that the majority of women that are incarcerated for the reasons that were just said earlier. Just, I mean, I, I really do believe there by the grace of God go I, okay? Because I was born in the boogie down Bronx. You see what I look like, right? And just for being who I am, I could be thrown in prison. So if you layer that on top of the fact that many of the women who are incarcerated have been victims of domestic violence, they may have as children had either seen or experienced abuse. Then they're being abused in the prison. Sometimes as Senator Weinberg said, you know, they're being, you know, molested, um, um, raped. Um, and it is traumatic, okay, to be sterilized, involuntarily sterilized, okay, and on and on and on. Many of the women have mental health issues. The majority of the women have depression or anxiety. If the women are using substances, okay, they need treatment. And we know that some prisons do a better job than others, but we know that many of the women do not receive appropriate treatment either for their they're, they're, I don't want to even use the term mental illness, but for their depression and their anxiety or for their substance use. And this is critical because in addition to that, they have the trauma of being separated from their children. Two thirds, I believe, and, and, and please um, anybody on, on, on here, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe about two thirds of the incarcerated women have approximately two children. You heard what Miss Dillon said, how when she left, they, they were tiny little people. And when she came out, they were teenagers, they were young adults. That is severely traumatic, okay? So the whole issue of trauma-informed care, right, is a critical one. And if you want the women to be successful in reentry when they get out, because due to COVID, COVID is a very interesting thing as a result of COVID-19, you have a lot more prisoners being released, right? They are going to need not only care, because many have chronic illnesses and whatnot, but many, if they're gonna be successful, need treatment for, for, the, for their, their mental health, for their depression, for their anxiety, if they have substance use disorder and just trauma-informed care for them as well as their children and their families. Because remember, one of the ways that you try to help the women heal, right, is through family reunification. We haven't even touched on that, but you know, I, I believe Ms. Cohen did a good job touching on, an excellent job touching, you know, starting to address that area, it, you know, in this film. But but that is so important. And even though we're we're, we're even, you know, in, in the Commission on Reentry and Women, we talk about the care of the women. We all know as women, whether we have children or not, you're going to take care of that child first before you're going to take care of yourself. And if you're all experiencing trauma then we have to take care of the family, however we define that family in terms of that trauma and, and not just the woman herself. Thank you so much. I feel that you really did a broad range, a, a broad sweep of uh, across various forms of trauma that were highlighted in the film and more. Um, you know, this panel has just been phenomenal. You've been able to touch on so many things. And, and as we wrap up, um, I want to give everyone an opportunity, one last point here, um, to really, in closing, you know, Kelly really um, spoke to a happy ending, right? What is her happy ending? What is that going to be? And, you know, in this time where there are various folks that are talking about 
uh, you know, restorative justice and talking about talking about pleasure activism and talking about, you know, just uh, enjoy and, and peace. You know, these are basic things too, right? Just basic needs, basic um, experiences. And so what does, uh, what is it that you're thinking about in terms of the work you do and your thought around um, how to create spaces and opportunities um, for joy and for happy endings for women. And so I wanna start, Helen, I, I, I know I keep coming back to you, but I wanna be sure that, uh, that, that from, the, from the work that you're doing you know, there on the ground, um, what, is your, what is your thought? Well, I, I think a happy ending um, in this situation and, you know, and again, this is, was really the impetus, you know, for us to be involved in supporting this film and getting this story out. And again, thank you, Erica, for telling the story. Thank you, Tiff, for, you know, bringing it forward is that um, the, our, our fights continue. I mean, there's more to do. You, you've told a story. We can't unknow what we know now. Um, and we need to stand together shoulder to shoulder. Um, those of us who are white need to use our, you know, learn about our privilege and use our privilege um, to be able to support so that these stories are no longer um, and that this, you know, cannot happen. So, you know, I think the happy ending here is women, all women standing together um, to fight alongside Kelly and all the Kellys, you know, that are out there. Um, and again, there's a lot, I mean, just in this conversation, we've heard so many ways that anyone who watched this film and felt the anger or the outrage or, you know, whatever it brought up for you, don't, don't let that sit and simmer and go away. Now take that and use it for action. Um, connect with one of the organizations, um, do your part to help support legislation that's out there. Um, and, and help push it forward. Call your elected officials on, you know, whatever level, you know, wherever you are in the country. I know that's one of the beauties of TIF, the way it is this year, people watching this could be from anywhere, not just New Jersey. Um, but, uh, you know, find ways to support. Do not put your head in the sand. Do not just think, wow, this was an important story. And then tomorrow pick up and move on someplace else. Um, this, should, this should activate us. Um, and they should move us all into action and find ways uh, that we can, that, you know, we can be of service to be able to end stories like this. Thank you so much, Helen, for your, for your, um, for your words of wisdom and, and, um, and call, the call to action, right? And someone on here uh, did ask, you know, is there unified action, a unified work to addressing um, violence? And I think that, uh, and I think that this is the call. Yeah, and I also want to say, I mean, and the call is lots of ways. I mean, there's there's so many amazing organizations. Again, Erica listed some, and, and you know, whether you volunteer, whether you um, donate money, um, you know, whether you help share the story, um, you know, we're we're embarking on the Thanksgiving holiday, which I hope we'll all be doing safely from Zoom with our family um, and not in large groups, but. These are conversations that you can be sharing and having. Spread the word, spread the information. I mean, you know, again, um, there, there's there's lots of ways uh, to be an activist and to take part in, um, you know, in in in, a ha in helping create a happy ending. Incredible! Thank you for that call to activism, even from your chair, even from your laptop even from your phone, wherever it's coming from. I see that you've unmuted um, yourself as well, um, uh, Senator Weinberg. What are you yeah. thinking? Well, as I was sitting here, just thinking about the sponsors of this film, the National Council of Jewish Women, the YWCA, the 100 Black Women. If you got together in a coalition and had a public hearing on issues around women incarcerated and invited some of the at least former uh, inmates to come and speak with the spotlight on it. You've got, you've got three outstanding organizations that run the gamut. Just something that occurred to me as I was sitting here uh, watching and listening because it is that kind of a spotlight that will help move these issues forward. As we talked and as I thought about the film, I mean, can there even be such a thing when you're an incarcerated inmate 
as informed consent. I mean, the two words almost don't make sense to somebody who is in that position. And it's not something that they're going to be able to practice. And added to that, the other thing I would like to do is clone Dr. Pagan. Listen. <laughs> I'm right there with you, right there with you. Okay. That's my two suggestions for the evening. <laughs> well, I mean, and you know, so she's a doctor, so maybe she can help make that. <laughs> That's Thank right. you. You're out how to clone yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator Weinberg. I mean, there's the resounding support and, and, and appreciation and respect for the work that you've done Thank uh, you. and the ground that you've laid. And, and ultimately, I love knowing that you're going to go back and that question about truly can there be informed consent, having that stick with you means so much means so much because I think that is truly at the very core, as Erica said, at the very core of this point. Um, so, so important. So thank you so much for your time tonight, doctor, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the several doctors over here, because we're going to clone you. So the multi-doctor over here, can you please uh, tell us what you're thinking? What are your last words in general? If there's anything you want to share around joy or, or around, um, around uh, uh, a happy ending, or just you want to expand more of what you were thinking or what's been shared. Sure. First of all, I have to say this, right? I'd have to leave TNAC. All the senator has to do is say to me, Tanya, I need you to do, or any of the people she that work for her, Tanya, I need you to do X. And I'm like, okay, Senator. <laughs> and I'm there for her. Um, really, we owe so much to her. Um, I, I sincerely don't know how to create a happy ending. I think if we really respect the women, we have to ask them. We have to ask, I, I wanted to hear from Kelly Dillon so badly, what would be a happy ending for her? Ms. Cohn, maybe you could go back and, and ask her that. Do you know? Yes, yes. absolutely. Kelly has been on the, on the press tour with us and, uh, you know, as an active participant in the filmmaking process, you know, we, we crafted this ending together and she, she would say while she's blessed that she's been able to reconnect with her son, she's still working on that relationship. She has not received her happy ending yet. And her happy ending is reparations. And that includes not only the accountability component um, through monetary compensation for the sterilization survivors, but also a memorial so that we, we may never forget and also a task force that is put together to notify so many people who were sterilized who still to this day mm. don't know that they were sterilized. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. And I, I did want to say one other thing if I can, if you, if you don't mind, please, everybody on the phone, anybody on Zoom, anybody who you know, Please, COVID-19 has killed so many of us, including the women in prison. We have to mask, we have to distance. If you love your loved ones, Zoom, drive by, you'll see them next year, okay? But for the women who are incarcerated, we must, we must make sure that they have the PPE they need that the guards who are working with them have the PPE. Everybody who, it, who comes in contact with them. And really, since most of them shouldn't be there, more of them should be out, okay? Most of the women who are in prison, and, and help me out, uh, Ms. Cohn, if I'm wrong, and, and Senator Weinberg and everybody else, they are there for nonviolent right. crimes. Right? So that's all I have to say. And if you haven't gotten your flu shot or your pneumonia shot, please get it. Thank you. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you for all of that, uh, for the reminders that we're having this film and this discussion within the context of COVID, how that overlaps with this issue, how consent wraps up in that as well, in terms of people being able to be safe and healthy. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I just think that it is, uh, that this has just been a, a really important conversation. Um, I've appreciated everything that everyone has stated this evening. Thank you all so much for your time. Dr. Tanya, we're all, everybody's on first name basis. Dr. Tanya, Doc, Senator Loretta, Helen, Erica, thank you for everything. Um, and what I wanna just be sure that the audience knows is that the last film, which is airing tomorrow is Crescendo. And, um, and it is uh, again, Wednesday, November 25th at 7.30 PM. You can buy tickets up to one hour before screening time uh, for tomorrow night uh, for the last film. And you can get your tickets at the TNECfilmfestival.org. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you audience for being present with us and sticking in this conversation with us and going all the way to the end with us. Thank you and good night.